because they can't gain them points. There's got to be someone who's trying to throw plants in the back. Yeah, I mean, you might go in the back. Does anybody well, want to fall back if you put one PSI CO2 in there? Yeah, so yeah, so so right. Well, the thing is, I, I do know that they basically tend to prefer to grow them in high pressure CO2 environments. Like in, in Japan, they have these vertically integrated farms now. They're really kind of creepy. Oh. It's, it's like, yeah. yeah, it's like you, like you walk into a room and it and looks all, like it looks yeah. like that room from the Matrix of all the guns, except it's like cabbages yeah. on the rack, and it's like high pressure yeah. CO two. In there, are like incredibly bright white lights. It looks like an Apple store for cabbages. Um, so, <laughs> but yeah, like each one is a perfect you know cabbage, and it does pretty well. But I think it's high pressure CO two. But the thing is, you know, for co for like large scale colonization, yes, we do need to be able to grow crops in the ambient atmosphere. But for the initial settlements, we're gonna we can we can always put a pressure envelope. Sure. Yeah, so that's so then it turns into a very high pressure. pressure. It's expensive. Mm -hmm. It's expensive, but it has to be high pressure. I mean, ideally, there's probably. I mean, it seems like there's got to be someone who's done research in trying to grow plants in a Martian atmosphere. Does that wouldn't be that hard to do. Basis order. for Zubrin's confidence about all this in What's this that? area. I, this he, Zubrin's. I haven't gone all the way through. So maybe okay, I, I, he, he, I remember I read his book years ago. I'm looking forward to. It. Um, he seemed to have a lot of confidence, and I do remember he had a story to tell him there about that. Why? About growing crops? Yeah. On, yeah. on the, on the bare surface of Mars? Greenhouse. Oh, okay. yeah. But in, in the soil, in, in Martian soil? Well, the Martian soil is fairly poisonous. Well, but it's fairly. Yeah, so it's very, I don't remember. Very acidic reducing acidic, environment. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're the right person to ask about <laughs> <laughs> So, can we tell us about plants? Plant? Tell us about plants growing in. Can we grow plants? Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know enough about the soil, uh, soil on Mars, but I do know that it is a very, it's a very acidic reducing environment. So, anytime you introduce any water, it's going to form acid, which is oh, not going to, not going to. It will do well for some plants, I'm not a botanist, but um, but it will, the plants that you probably want to grow, it's not going to be good for that. So. Is there a decent amount of nitrogen on Mars? I don't know. Because I think that's that's one of the things that's a really short supply on the moon. Uh, there's sometimes the nitrogen permafrost on the surface of Mars is going to get colder. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here's the interesting thing. We're talking about growing plants on the surface of Mars, but we're not taking into account the shifts in temperature from daytime to nighttime. If you're in a, a greenhouse tent, you're probably going to be okay on that count. Actually, so you're insulating the area, but you want to use the soil that's there instead of well, cause, building cause your own. It's soil. relatively easy to like bring tent material with you. Sure. Bringing dirt is really hard. Yeah. Well, so not I want to bring dirt, but separating the constituents that you want. Mm. Yeah. That, well, I think you're, you know the actual path forward is likely to be some combination of when we get there, figuring out what the heck is really there, and then. Right now, a lot of yeah, we we're totally cart horsing here. Yeah. <laughs> I need to correct myself. I don't think it's nitrogen from CO2. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering about that. I, I, but as far as the end goes, I think I remember seeing some end numbers and somebody talking about the atmosphere here recently. Apparently, plants in low atmosphere have some problems. They act as if they're drying out, stomata close, and they drop leaves. But there are also some benefits. They flush hormones more quickly. So it's not an all lose scenario. So I guess a high altitude plants would probably do better. Right now, how do those work as crops? Not great. It tends to yeah. <laughs> it's like silver thorn. <laughs> Which you can you can make a tea out of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and sequoia trees. Tree. No, yeah. Yeah. trees. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I guess I mean stuff that we eat tends to be like lowland, like you know, modified grasses and grains and things like that. That's so but getting getting colonization going implies a certain volume us being able to get people and, and mass and whatnot up there. Um, what's what's everybody's sense on how far away that is? I was actually a little surprised that um, some people seem to think that the, the tourism thing is going to really uh, dominate for quite a while. Um, anybody have any thoughts on tourism to Mars? Uh, well, to, to just tourism in general, as far as, I mean, my model for, for Human exploration is the European expansion of the, the 16th and 17th centuries. And I don't remember that there was a huge tourism component there. I don't remember much of it. Well, no, seriously. I mean, so if, if people now are thinking that's part of it, what's what's changing? Well, to, 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 to pause it there and go back to what you're discussing first. Um, so 
I, I, I have some basic questions about European expansion. How how large of a complement of crew and, and colonists did the average colonist ship have in that period? Like the flotilla, like how how many people were they bringing over to four? How what is the seed of a colony? How many people? Jamestown was what was it a couple hundred I think, um, and how soon did people start having babies? Okay. That's what I'm saying. Like, are we well, going to be able we, to so, so you want to make as many resources once you get there, and that right. includes humans. I, yeah, I think we so. actually even need to take a step back from that and say, what is the purpose of sending people there? There are different purposes. So, for example, the colonization of America, the purpose was both religious freedom and like more natural resources being able to grow more crops. So, that purpose versus tourism purpose versus just like exploration, sending somebody just to say that you did, those all would require very different numbers of people, different resources, you know, I think it, you've got to figure out why you're sending the people there first to figure out what you need. And, you know, I think for colonization, the, the two main drivers are always going to be freedom of one sort or another and also economic engines. And I don't think we've identified any cash crops we can bring back from Mars. But, no. uh, but that doesn't mean that there won't be something eventually. Yeah, and I'm not sure freedom is a big enough driver at this point to be able to send people there, maybe. Yeah, I was going to say, by the time it is, people will be dead. So it's like, yeah, that's true. It's like martial law. You can't leave once. It's, it's like there. they push a button and, oh, I should have left. <laughs> so wouldn't it be great if uh, kind of a... Uh, just oh, one quick wasn't statement. your original question, what needs to happen for us to get to Mars? So, what needs to happen? I mean, I'm not the one to start the conversation. I'm just, I'm, I'm asking, given this. No, but, but, but. Well, the reason I'm trying to get back to your yeah. question, I'm sorry for the interruption. When I got home last night, a friend sent me an email that there's a new project. It's NASA and DARPA. Maybe you've heard of this. It's the 100 year Starship project. There's a ton Actually, Scott, Scott Norman, one of the organizers, uh, is an entrant to that. Great. I'm, no. yeah, I'm doing a panel on it at 1.30, but in response to your question, these people are looking at a 100 year uh, scenario. But it's not going to just be what what has to be happening 100 years from now. It's what has to be happening you know, today right. exactly. for us exactly. to be on the right path. Yeah. So I think that they're probably going to at least partially answer your, your question by mm -hmm. having that kind of a, a, a gathering. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's also the answer to your question about the, uh, why people think that tourism is important right now. Because people see that as one of the first markets that can be used to start wedging the prices in. And then once the prices are down, then the call is Slightly different. Did anybody see um, Robert Bigelow's talk at ISDC? Um, he made mention. It's on on YouTube and online. There's a, you know, he he felt strongly that China is probably going to get back to the moon first before the U.S. does, and, and I don't know if they've signed the Moon Treaty or, or, or what they did, but there he he felt that it's just his opinion that they're going to pull out before, and then at that point they will be making attempts to go there and they will lay claim. Moon, and that'll be just such a wake up moment for uh, the entire planet that, that Mars and, and the moon, and, and some of the, or maybe some, some of the moons of Mars, which they've talked about being a stepping point to Mars, will really uh, be very keenly on our radar. Yeah, well, there, there's people who advocate that we need to just pull out about a big treaty too because it's too limiting and, and it doesn't, you know, the motivations to get out there typically include significant personal gain for the personal risk that you're incurring. And if there's no clear path to the personal gain right now, um, what's it going to be? I mean, the whole idea of you go out there and you stake a claim. Claim to what? Who's who's recognizing that? And, and what do you get to do with it? Not you know That's not really clearly established. And right now, you're almost, it's, it's I've heard it described in some places as what's called the tragedy of the anti-commons. The tragedy of the commons, of course, everybody overuses it. Tragedy the anti-commons being nobody can use it because there's no way for anybody to use it. It's to get the gain out of it so nobody actually even tries. Well, I mean, and if, if, you try, mine, if you try to do it, and let, let's say you go to the moon and start mining helium-3, it doesn't matter if you have a claim or not because you're the only one doing it. It's going to take a long time for somebody else to get around to doing it. Well, yeah, you know, there's other, I think there's other things that need to be considered, though. Like, for example, right now, you know, most everybody that I've heard in, in this past year or so talking about launches, everybody's talking about getting permission. 
from whoever you got your permission from, so you can go out there, right? So we're not, we're not at the point where everybody, anybody has enough of their own resources to defendably say, I'm going to go there and do that and screw you, right? So you know, when you if you went to to the Americas, you could live there. Right, I mean, you know, so if, if you didn't like the king or whatever, you didn't need the king, you could go and live. It seems like there's but been implication space. recently when you hear about SpaceX's intention, you know, putting the Mars thing out there, and it's just kind of, I think, putting it, you know, trying to maybe, whether their audience is the mainstream public or Congress, sitting sort of saying, this is our vision and this is kind of what our, uh, you know, p the potential intention is if there's a, you know, a privately funded or, or been supported by other governments, not necessarily NASA, trip to Mars, what are you going to do about it, you know? Right. Well, and that's, I, I think that to some degree the, the whole, somebody's got to go do something and thumb their nose at, at the rest of whoever's not doing something. I think it's really going to stir us because, you know, a huge part of what stirred the moon race was it was a race. There was you know, people who feared that things would happen if someone else got there first. And I think that was a huge component, my understanding of what happened with the European expansion, was every king wanted to get his piece of the planet out there, and despite what the Pope said about, you know, Spain, you get this part, and Portugal, you get this part, everybody said, well, I'm just going to do it anyway. Well, speaking of competition, having there be kind of this race, I mean, in this room, we have so many different companies competing as well. Mm -hmm. Is there kind of a race with that, some type of thing that can go along, or maybe teamwork that can make us get there faster. Mm -hmm. What kind of things do you think people are out there? I, I think that one of the things somebody should do, I'm sorry, you know, be honest, or somebody, somebody should throw the institute return resource, whatever the heck you call it, you know, the, the return fuel generator, somebody just throw that up there on Mars and say, okay, it's there, now go get it, go do something about it. Well, Zuber calls for that kind of a, an approach, right, and prize money awarded to, to address the technological hurdles that need to be met to, to do these things for themselves. I mean, in situ resource utilization is what you asked. Uh, right, yeah. So, yeah. Go ahead. I just had a question because um, a lot of times, like right now, we're talking about um, the value or the worth, like why we would go to Mars um, and talking about resources and plants and things. But if, if it were a hospitable place that people could go to, um, you could kind of um, see the appeal if something were to happen to our planet, like the, what we're doing right now with um, uh, greenhouse gases and effects on the climate, if this place becomes uninhabitable or something happens, we're going to have to leave. So uh, my question was um, on the idea of terraforming. And how far off that is. Have you ever read Red Mars? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Red, Red Mars, Blue Mars, Mars, Green Mars, Mars, that's your homework assignment. Yes. <laughs> uh, anyone who's at all interested yeah. in, in Martian uh, colonization and terraforming should read ben Red Mars. It is sci fi, but it's the closest reality sci fi. Yeah. Like, that's pretty much how you would do it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's Kim very, very Stanley good. Robinson. It, it takes, however, it is a very long term process. Yeah, he uses some tricks. And you have there. to sort of. So for, you have to you have to figure out a way to get there and live there before the planet is hospitable. So long term, I think most people can agree that we would want to terraform Mars, even though that would be kind of difficult. You're going to have trouble keeping your atmosphere intact because it's a small planet and all that stuff. But it could it could be done very very long term. Assuming we you know allow ourselves to right. I mean right now we're very very careful not to damage. The environment. Are you in red? And yeah. <laughs> so actually, that was interesting. Mars, in, in the book, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The there was a significant political change in the Mars colonization group that said we should, should, really should not be terraforming this. But it is a it is a a, a natural place that has an inherent right to exist as it exists now, which is. Interesting, worth thinking about. I personally don't agree with that. I think it's just terraforming. It's asking to be terraformed. I mean, are we going to, is it, is it a historical <laughs> register, or is it, you know? People <laughs> keep saying that, oh, we, we are very careful about how we sterilize our satellites, you know, everybody will wear clean suits around it. And if you talk to Chris McKay or a bunch of other people at NASA Ames who are focused on this, we actually haven't done that good of a job, and they've already found human microbes on extraterrestrial areas that, so it's kind of a moot point, this whole argument that, oh, well, we're going to be perfect at keeping our skin cells right, but, and our bacteria away from But the thing is, whether or not we succeed in doing that is, is sort of orthogonal to whether or not we think we should be trying to do that. And that might prevent any well, effort at terraforming. But there's, no, but, no, no, there's sort of two the arguments that there. are going on now, where half of what's being done is just a waste and thought experiments. 
If you're going to do something half-assed, don't do it at all. I'm also going to throw out that it's the ultimate of ironies to have people practicing slash and burn agriculture in the Brazilian rainforest and then thinking it's not going to terraform Mars. <laughs> it is like, just horrific. We're already yes. terraforming. Yeah, it's like, okay, yeah, let's take everything that's good and holy and, and burn it down and then leave a dead world completely dead because, uh, I don't know, because we follow Thanatos. Uh, but but I, I wanted to point out something that before, before we get much further into like these, these kind of deep, kind of like, you know, what if 120 years from now, Okay, um, what do we actually need to have constructed and built and in, in place politically and societally to enable the, sh the enormous amount of resource commitment it's going to take to do an actual Mar you know, manned Mars colonization mission? Not a Robert Zubrin, although you could start with Zubrin style of Mars Direct, but we're talking about, like, you need to build a spaceship. You need to build an honest-to-God Mars transfer vehicle. It is going to be a Battlestar Galactica because it has to have 200 people in it or something. And it's going to be the size of four or five space stations, and it's going to be it's the biggest engineering right project in the history of humankind. And right. it's going to be badass. But in order to build that, we have to get to the point where we can do that. Right. And so, so how do we get to that point? Let me chill, uh, Congress. So <laughs> does everyone here know what happened with Neocore in the 90s? I didn't know. How about a pro space so, president? Muircorn. Yes. How about a leader? How about, well, you know, like John Glenn running for president, but a younger version of John Glenn here. <laughs> so, Mirkor in the 90s was actually a private citizen named Walt Anderson who bought the space station here from the Soviets. And they owned it for 90 days. They sent the first commercial astronauts up there. They retrofitted it. This is the iconic image of a space station with a pirate ship on the outside. They actually did this. They were going to do tourism to it. And what happened was the U.S. was like, well, if you want to build the ISS, we need to do it with Russia because we don't have the funds, blah, 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 blah. They ended up putting all their political weight in like to shut it down because they weren't involved in the planning of this. If you haven't seen this, watch the movie, uh, Orphans of Apollo. It explains it more succinctly in 90 minutes than I can do in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. But the big thing is this is the reason why we're working with the FAA for commissions, why x Corps, Maston, SpaceX, Everybody, Armadillo, Blue Origin, Sierra Nevada Corps, this is why they're doing the CC debt contracts. Because without doing that with NASA to have some type of hand holding, the government it thinks it's a it thinks it's a king shift. It will shut you down because it looks at you as a threat. And we are trying to not well, we're trying to circumvent that, but by doing it in partnerships. So the political thing that has to happen is NASA has to change. And it's in the process of doing so. You have a battle of it needs to be in-house, and you have the other people thinking, well, we can do a commercial thing and let NASA do the grand missions. So if you give NASA its high seat on a throne to do the grand missions, and we have fun being the mechanics and the settlers. Yeah. Well, well it's, somewhere. It's, it's not just mm -hmm. NASA, though. Like, this is going, like, Correct. commitment of resources to build a Mars transfer vehicle. But that's before so you can get a commitment of resources, you need to have the political agreement to allow you to do so. Because the way today's age is going, I mean, Walt Anderson has been in jail for the last six years for tax evasion. He was arrested coming into the country. Who? Walt Anderson. He's the, the man who funded and bought Air Corps. He was a huge funder in the initial start of the Walt He's in jail? Tax He's in jail. Tax with, with, it's unconstitutional. In America? In America. New Jersey. Welcome to... So, this is the problem we have. If you're going to go out of your way to make yourself just ignore the government, they're going to come back and bite you because they're going to find some clause to do it unconstitutionally. I'd like to add a grain of salt here. My understanding is he was pretty flat out evading his. There was some legitimacy to what he was doing. Maybe he was targeted, but there was legitimacy. And the thing is, you're. I think that if you start to get into the arguments of like us versus Congress versus NASA, you start basically breaking apart the arguments into so many little pieces that the majority of America isn't going to listen to you. And if you can't get the majority behind you, you're always going to have the fight of why the hell are you doing this? Why are you taking money from my children, from my poor people, from my well, neighborhood need, to build this right. thing? You need, you know, you you sell, so you need to you sell, sell it. Concept. Exactly. You, you need, need to sell leader. it as a point of I don't think this that, will bring I don't think something back to us. Need a, uh, Why don't we just, just not sell it and forget about NASA and the government? Is it possible to go international with this? Forget about nash nations and that type of thing. Is it worldwide? Why do we do it? Because when you come back, back they're they're down, down. they all have yeah. all the yeah. right. Why come back? <laughs> 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 well, wait, 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 wait. I, I want to hear more about this. Okay. There have already been several uh, programs, projects, whatever you want to call them. A couple of them were started in 
headquartered in Switzerland just because, uh, or, yeah, Switzerland, because of their Excellent. neutrality, their uh, pretty much uh, as long as you pay your taxes, we don't, we don't hurt anybody, we don't care what you do. Uh, and just basically the UN said, no, you can't do that. We're in charge of anything above the atmosphere. And that being, like, what, what was kind of the general thrust of these groups? Uh, they, they were, one of them was a moon colony that was being set up by a bunch of people who didn't want any publicity for themselves, but mostly it was their kids wanted to do it, so they said, okay, here's a couple million, you know, go play. <laughs> And uh, who are these people? Yeah. Uh, um, are they adopting? <laughs> <laughs> they are not adopting. Yeah. They, they the will, point is what they ran into. Yeah, yeah. Well, the point is what they ran into is as soon as they got beyond a few friendly bankers, they ran into the UN who had the exact same attitude every other government has is wait a minute, you're not doing this unless we're in charge of it. Yeah, but what's the UN? The UN is China, Russia, and the United States. That's no. all it is. I mean, you, no, it was mostly the little what countries right now. Right. China, Russia, no, and the exactly. United States. So, yeah. like, what? I mean, yeah, the little countries might have disagreed. Sure, that's fine. But think about it. The UN is is the same thing that the League of Nations was. It's a failed. It's a failed world state. It's never gonna. It's never gonna have any true power. Well, so but they, they, they can say, they can say no. They can say no, and, and they can send the blue hats. Well, yeah, but what are the blue hats going to do? Forget the blue hats. They'll, they'll shoot, yeah, they'll shoot. Oh, the lawyers, the lawyers, that's worse. Yeah, so the so, lawyers. Yeah, I mean, so the steps, you know, it, it, whatever gets done has to be sanctioned, which involves public opinion on the right side, because that's what drives all the politicians. So it seems, that one, the conclusion that I've kind of come to over the past year or so of getting back into all this is somehow we've got to see all the media stuff with, the fact that going into space is just the next natural thing that anybody would do. Why anybody would even question that is just foolish because it's, of course we're going to do that. Well, I'm going to push that advocate here for a second. Why should we leave this planet when we have so many problems on this land that are more pressing and will affect more people? If you imagine all the money wasted on the space program, you could have, I don't know, fed everyone in Somalia or Certain, something. Uh, sure. that. So and and there, there are people that. who say that. And, and the counter there are counter arguments to that. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to, yeah. if you really want to dig into those details, I can talk about the points to, to counter that. But the, the point is that um, by, by, I think that what we need is a, a, a sort of viral word of mouth grass. And, and part of where this comes from, it's a very interesting point. There's a guy who used to be a terrorist. He, he sat in, and very well educated. He got stuck in jail in, in Egypt for, a decade, and he comes out of that, and he's like, you know what? There's some real problems with that. that he's going around now t talking about his experience and what was happening. And one of his points is the, the Islamist fundamentalists are filling a hole that is there at the, at the ground level, a need for services that are not being met by the dictators, whatever. And he said part of what the problem is there's no ground movement on the democratic side filling that hole either. And I made the leap from that, wow, if we stir up a, a pull on, on the political forces from the ground up, if, if, it, if, if it becomes pervasive that, of course, humanity is evolving out into space, of course we're going to go out there and all this. And if, that, if that's the basis for the discussion, not the, the whole, oh, it's taking money away from this, that, the other thing. But if we can spread that, that meme around, then two, three, five years from now, when we are trying to actually get funding for the big kahuna, the, the first one that has to go out there, then they're already there. And so part of my point is, this is, and I was actually going to give a talk here later, but I, I've got to head out. Um, you know, what we can do right now is go talk to your neighbor and tell them, I mean, I, I, I walk around and, and there's, there's kind of two or three things I talk to people who have no idea about space flight. I say, did you know that it took three to six months for Europeans to get to the New World? Did you know that right now, given the technology that we have right now, nothing needs to be invented. It takes us three to six months to get somewhere. And that the political, social, sort of everything is claimed environment that was very similar in Europe is right here on the planet right now. And the only thing to do is basically just get doing it. And that the percentage of resources to go do that is actually, while well, we, we talk about it's, it's huge, in the grand scheme of all the flow of economic stuff on this planet, it's actually very small. It doesn't actually take a huge amount. I mean, it's it's 
you know, it's NPR, uh, it's, it's a blip on the overall budget, right? And, and that's that's one of the other points about all these things. So, um, well, there's a lot of entrenched interests that will tell you, no, you've got to fight the market project because it's critical to whatever, okay? And there's a lot of entrenched interests that will say, no, you've got to have a job in Huntsville or whatever, okay? And there's all the equivalents to that. Really, that's just entrenched interests trying to, to feed their own face, and, and the reality is, we can go. We're, you know, there are still iron people willing to go out into wooden ships, just like there were back then, and eventually it'll build, and, and we just need to go. And um, it, it's amazing that people pick up on that. And, and you take them from where they are, which is not thinking about it, to tying it to a couple of things they know about, and suddenly you've, sh you've shifted the conversation and people's minds are open. I, I just Can want I just to add something? Yeah, it's, uh, we're, we're, we're out of, we're like, we're 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 the disgust people have right